Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Microsoft Build session. My name is Isabella Havruko, and I'm a solution specialist within data analytics and AI in Microsoft Norway. It's my pleasure to introduce speakers for this session. Jure Öfstos, who is Chief Technology Officer with C4IR Ocean, and Eirik Stavelin, Senior Data Scientist at NUA Ignite. You and Eric will tell us more about their work on unlocking the power of ocean data through the Ocean Data Platform and show us the environmental impact of 250,000 ships sailing now across the world. The Ocean Data Platform is an open and collaborative data platform built on Cognite Data Fusion technology and is a project supported by Microsoft AI for Earth program. It is also one of the key initiatives of C4IR Ocean, a nonprofit foundation established by Ocker Group and the World Economic Forum last year, with the goal of connecting industry, academia, governments, and the public to create solutions that will restore health and ensure future productivity of the ocean. Microsoft joined C4IR Ocean as a co-founding partner and together with the foundation, took on a leadership role in high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy, an initiative of 14 heads of states, including prime ministers of Norway, Australia, Japan, and Canada, that joined forces in order to build the momentum towards sustainable ocean economy. The panel put forward ambitious plans to protect the ocean for future generations and made commitments for which development of solutions like the Ocean Data Platform plays a crucial role. With this short introduction, let me hand over to Eirik and you. So thank you, Isabel. Um, we are so happy to be here today and presenting our topic at Microsoft Build. So we're going to talk about the real-time environmental impact of 250,000 ships. Um, this has been a project that we have been running in our team for the past three months. And we are aiming at showing uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the entire ship fleet in uh, hourly intervals. And we're using what we call AIS data to do this. That's uh, position tracking of ships, quite much data. And we fuse this with vessel particulars, knowledge about the ship's dimensions, fuel type, and so on. And we feed this into an emission model. So we're going to deep dive into this later on in this presentation. A few words about our uh, foundation. So we are C4IR Ocean. And that's based upon more than 180 years of history in Norway with uh, responsible ocean management and uh, maritime technology innovation. And last year, Aker and the World Economic Forum decided to set up this affiliate center, C4IR Ocean, where we have a global mandate uh, on focusing on ocean sustainability. And we are developing and operating the ocean data platform and we're also having the lead on one of the action coalitions coming out from the high-level panel for sustainable ocean economies, the Ocean Data Action Coalition. And we do this together with partners like Microsoft and other partners as well. So the ocean is big, is huge, 360 million square kilometers. Uh, that's 36 times the size of the United States. It's also deep, going down to 11,000 meters in the Mariana Trench. And if you look into volume, we're talking about 1.3 billion cubic meters of water. So where to start and where to focus? Well, all the projects we are running in our center, C4IR Ocean, is focused around these three uh, mission, uh, missions or impact areas, better ocean use, zero emissions to air and water, and zero plastic in the ocean. So uh, the ocean has been a very important part of my childhood, education, and working career. And uh, like many other people on this planet, I'm passionate about the ocean. And uh, I have been working in the maritime space for many, many years. And I have seen the most beautiful of the beautiful in the ocean, but I also seen how humans are impacting 
the ocean in a negative way. So this makes us think, what can we do to enable better insight through data and technology? How can we improve uh, and, and get a better fact-based decision-making process where we bring together ocean industries, scientists, policymakers, the general public and citizen science? So that is what we are doing with our work in the Ocean Data Platform in CIFAR IR Ocean. And, and now we're going to deep uh, dive a little bit more into one specific solution that we have made. And as you all know, uh, many of the industries, and specifically the ocean industries, are causing some of the challenges we see in the ocean today. But it's also important to, to, to realize that the ocean is a significant part of the solution to climate change. And that's why we are working with progressive industries, thought leaders, and fo uh, focus on the positive impact stories. So with that, I, I give the word to Eirik, who will uh, deep dive a little bit more into the technical solution. Hello, I'm Eirik, data scientist with NOAA Ignite, working with the Ocean Data Platform. And the Ocean Data Platform wants to track emissions from shipping because what gets measured gets managed. And enabling sustainable and productive management of the ocean is a key factor in ensuring a healthy planet. So it's down to figuring out how greenhouse gases are calculated. I'm sure you heard about uh, uh, CO2, how much CO2 something emits or about the greenhouse gas footprint as a variable people are concerned about. The method for estimating greenhouse gases is not a secret. The method is well known and described in method papers typically accompanying larger uh, emission studies. The implementations though are not readily available. And the big deal for us became to make an implementation that matches those used in the global shipping industry. Nobody can tell you exactly how many ships sails the seas. The latest International Maritime Organization's greenhouse gas study counted for about 237,000 ships. One of the world's largest ship registries, the IHS Fairplay, has 127,000 ships for 2020. Global Fishing Watch has 1.5 million ships in their database, out of which five, out of about 500,000 we found on the seas in 2020. If we take the latest global emissions inventories, there are about 200,000 active ships constitutes what we call global shipping. Out of these, the top 20% uh, produces about 90% of all the emissions. It's the big ships that produces the biggest emissions, but at the same time, it's because the ships are so hugely large that shipping is the greenest mode of transportation. So much good is transported by comparatively smaller combined engine power. So if you saw a shipping vessel on the news this year, it probably was the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal, the ever given. That was almost 400 meters long and was the 42nd longest ship registered in this uh, huge database we use. Twice the size, size of the average of the largest category in this database. It can transport 20,000 standard shipping containers, uh, two of, uh, of which in a road mage makes up the, the load of a semi-truck. So it's 10,000 semi-trucks uh, worth of stuff. So most ships are smaller than this, much smaller. The average ship registry in this database is 86 meters. And the average of the smallest, shortest category is about 27 meters. That's the length of a basketball court. So that's still way larger than uh, the typical boat owned by a private person. So these are ships for professional use. Science progresses one funeral at a time is an old saying from Max Planck and the principle also applies here. Um, the idea of green shipping uh, relies to a large extent on new technologically superior ships taking over the jobs of old clunkers. So that means new designs, new fuels, new engines, 
and there sure is a lot of cool new tech coming to the world of maritime transport. Like this, there's a company here called Evoid that wants to electrify smaller vessels. So think what the, the car industry is doing right now. Or here, here's a totally new way of thinking about ships. So this is a fully electric, fully autonomous container ship called Yara Birkeline. So this is not built with the limitations of having a large crew of humans as a core feature, but uh, can thus optimize for other efficiencies than keeping a crew warm and happy. Here's a wind power vessel that is under development. The ship's design here aims to lower the emissions by up to 90%. So the masts here, the things that sticks up that looks like uh, chimneys, these are called rotor sails and they give wind assisted propulsion. These rotor sails can also in many cases be retrofitted to existing ships. So back to our problem. This must be a machine learning problem, right? And since we're at Microsoft Build, this is Azure ML to the rescue, right? Unfortunately, no. The signal that we would like to learn here, how much greenhouse gases goes up the chimney of the, of the ship, is not readily available for us unless we own a fleet of ships and can measure how much fuel uh, we use or how much green uh, black soot comes out the chimney. So if we can't measure that, we can't feed that into a machine learning algorithm that would aim to learn what moves this variable. But in the paper trail of the greenhouse gas studies, we found this, uh, this one study, the International Consortium on Clean Transportation's detailed methodology from 2017. And this is one iteration of the studies um, uh, for the methodologies that also the IMO uses. So these are bottom-up methodologies where we start at individual ship and you sum up for the whole fleet or the whole, all ships. So the ICCT made a big uh, difference to us because their methodology paper is clean, it's easy to read and it explicitly prints the equations. So writing good method papers um, is a lot like writing good documentation. It makes the next guy in line's life much easier. So here we go. Let's follow an AIS datum from a ship all the way through our emission model. Ships of a certain size emit uh, messages to the surroundings in order to avoid collisions. These are called AIS data for automatic identification systems. The data are varying in quality and not super reliable, and they come in large quantities. Many ships report every few seconds. Some report only once in a blue moon. Most professional ships emit enough data to get a good overview of what they are doing. AIS includes stuff like speed, direction, ID of vessel, etc. So AIS is picked up by other ships or by towers on land or by satellite, and it's shared to do its primary job, avoid collisions. After that, AIS is sold as a commodity, either as vintage batches all the way up to streaming data. Our data point has now traveled from the ship's radio, it's been picked up by a satellite and it's relayed to an AIS data broker and is now for sale. So we buy access to this data in partnership with uh, our NGO friends over at Global Fishing Watch. Here we see a map view of AIS data showing where the ships has traveled. So we see the northwestern part of the Mexican Gulf here. We have added different faces to the data indicated by plot color, showing what kind of operation the ship is making, such as cruising, maneuvering, and staying at anchor. As time series data show us um, how ships move, and if we we'll know a bit more about what kind of ship this is, we can estimate how hard this engine is working in order to make this movement. And if we know how much energy is needed and what kind of fuel and engine this ship has, we can estimate um, emissions. So we use AIS data from Spire, curated by our friends over at Global Fishing Watch. And for anyone who has been working on data cleaning and quality, we'll probably chip in our thanks to the efforts Global Fishing Watch does 
in washing billions of AIS signals. Our methodology works on a resolution of one signal per hour, resulting in only 581 million initial data points for 2020. So this is large, but still manageable by fairly conventional data processing methods. About 50% of global AIS data is missing and has to be filled in. Linear interpolation is inaccurate for long periods of missing data, and we need better ways of filling in missing points. So what we see here is a classic problem with linear interpolation uh, for missing data visualized. So a ship is traveling from the English Channel, emitting dense, nice uh, AIS signals uh, before it disappears from the data and pops up again uh, down by Gibraltar. And Traditionally, we linear inter linearly interpolate this and draw a straight line, cutting through land, in this case, Spain and Portugal. The method adjusts for this by penalizing these interpolated points a bit, as ships normally do not travel in such straight lines. On average, for all ships over a year, this probably don't make, uh, make much of a difference in emissions when accounted for, but it sure is sore on the eye. And we want our emissions data accessible through a map service and did find it worthwhile deviating from the ICCT method on this matter. So we are filling in missing AIS data with a pathfinding algorithm based on big data statistics. We build a huge graph uh, of paths broken down to a suitable resolution for passenger, tanker, cargo, tug, fishing vessels, etc. And we find the optimal path with the Dijkstra shortest path algorithm. All routing is performed in Azure with Postgres uh, database and the PG routing extension. So this is what this looks like. So here's a ferry going from Kiel, Germany to Oslo, Norway, a 20 hour journey. So we see multiple journeys here. On the less, uh, left, we have the interpolated where we have filled in the gaps using linear interpolation, drawing a straight line from the last known point to the next. And the results are all over the place in, in orange. On the right, we have the same journey with the same missing points interpolated using the routing. And we see it fits the green uh, points much nicer. So now we need the vessel particulars. So that's uh, ship types, engine types, fuel types, sizes, various indicat indicators for load capacity. And ship registries have existed for hundreds of years and contains exactly such details. We use the IHS Fairplay database for this. As you can imagine, due to both human nature and the variety in ships, uh, constructions and measurements, such databases are not 100% row column complete. In order to fill gaps, averages for ship types and capacity bins are used. And this is probably an excellent area to improve using machine learning, but we're stuck with the written methodology here. So the model used uh, to compute emissions is based on empirical work. I have highlighted the three modes of energy consumption on most ships. And in yellow, we have the main engine, the green bit covers the auxiliary engine, and the pink bit covers the boiler. Each of these are affected by what phase a ship is in, representing what kind of work this ship is doing. And each phase a ship is in depends on the distance to shore, the distance to port, the weather, whether the ship is in a river or the, on the ocean, and of course the speed and the class of the ship. So the main factor for affecting emission, uh, emissions is how much oomph the skipper is giving, how hard he pushes on the gas given uh, giving the sh uh, ship speed, but adjusted for uh, whether the state of the hull and how heavy the ship is loaded. Having all these factors figured out, the rest is lookup tables for the emission factors for, ship, uh, for ship's class, subdivided into capacity bins and fuel type. So it's, uh, it's uh, simple but complicated. Many um, accumulated small facts we implemented the model in Python with the expectations that this would depend on horizontal scaling for emission computation. Since the model has many ifs and buts, we 
and adjustments for special cases, we did a naive implementation first, doing every ship in sequential order and iterating over uh, each hour we compute emission for. This would make the whole thing much easier to understand, but we soon realized that we would run out of Azure credits and time before we had any big results. So Python is never chosen for speed, and I'd like to demo what that looks like. So here we see a for loop. We are iterating over all the AIS data from a ship uh, at a one hour resolution. There are lots of lookups and ifs and buts inside the compute emissions function here. So I start that. So first we fetch uh, 71 demo ships and then we iterate over those. And then we fetch the AIS data and the ships particulars and we iterate over the hours. So what's counting up now is the hours we have calculated emissions for, for this first chip. So I stopped the recording before this finished because it takes about two minutes per uh, ship. So clocking in at about two hours for our 61 test ships. So we rewrote this uh, emission calculation to rely on pandas data frames and numpy doing most operations on vectors and eliminating loops. So lookups are removed by merging uh, AIS data with lookup tables into data series, similar to how joins work in SQL. If it's else statements are, uh, can be removed using numpy select statements. So the math is now applied on vectors instead of individual vi uh, values. So we can do all the hours for this one chip at the same time. So now we start that. Um, Sure, many of you have experienced this for yourself, but wow, Python does not need to be slow. From hours and minutes to run uh, a ship's data for a year, we managed to remove all the slow Python code, and our program is now fast enough that Python becomes secondary to the speed of our databases. Now the loop is just over the pollutants we want to estimate. Now we clock in at about 2 minutes 37 for the 61 ships. But we can do better still. My laptop here has 8 cores, so let's uh, run 8 ships in parallel. Now the printing comes out all scrambled, uh, since we have 8 processes that are printing with no regard for each other, but that's fine. So now we clock in at about 33 seconds for all 61 ships. And I'm sure there are many places this can be optimized more, but now we are at a place where Python isn't, Python's speed isn't longer our main concern. So now AIS, uh, our AIS data has traveled from a ship into our database and it's been combined with uh, uh, details about this ship and we can compute greenhouse gas emissions fairly quick, and these can be stored back to the ODP data store. Since there are so many ships in the world, and we only know for sure about those registered in large ships registries, we compute those first. Then we start filling the holes for missing data. For ships with no hits, we use Global Fishing Watch as a fallback, as their database is much larger, but has much less detailed information. So for ships where we lack proper vessel particulars, but have an estimate size and class, we use averages from the good data, the first bit. And we break this into quartiles to account for the bias in these ships registries. They contain really large ships, and ships not registered there are likely to be much smaller. We are deviating from the methodology's intention uh, intentions when we compute emissions uh, from ships and look at these individually. But the world needs to see these ships traveling places they care about. And if the world needs better regulations for reporting or better, better data processing pipelines, so be it. The world needs to see the data we have, not the data we wish we had. So what we see here is a web app built on Streamlit for prototyping possible front ends, easily deployed on Azure App Service. So we see our huge ship again, the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal, the Ever Given. We see that it had a slow May and November, but it operated all the way through the year. And we see that it mainly traveled between Europe and China, 
and it did indeed prefer the Suez Canal route also in 2020. So I, I can see it go through Egypt there. This is the dev version of the Ocean Data Platform, and this is a use case for our emission service, where industry, academia, and the general audience can, can view, inspect, and download data, such as by drawing a polygon um, on the map uh, for a geographical area, uh, like this I drew here in the Gulf of Finland in, uh, in the Baltic Sea. The data can also be accessed by Software Developers Kit, perhaps the preferred methods for many of the audience here at Microsoft Build. Thanks a lot, uh, Eirik, for going into the, the, the details. It's a very exciting solution. Uh, but let's uh, zoom out a little bit. So you have learned a bit about our uh, solution in the Ocean Data Platform, an open and collaborative data platform where we are liberating ocean data by means of open APIs and SDKs and enable developers and data scientists to develop solutions for a, a productive and healthy ocean. So let me give, me, give you some uh, ideas around uh, what type of use cases we are thinking about and uh, services going forward. So one obvious opportunity is all the regulatory drivers you have out there. And I have just listed a few of them here. The EU taxonomy and Green Deal, the enhanced transparency framework from the Paris Agreement, and uh, the greenhouse gas strategy from the International Maritime Organization. So um, uh, emission reporting and, and, and uh, climate uh, impact, environmental impact, it will go towards uh, more real-time way of reporting, needing more high-fidelity data. And that's something you can find in the Ocean Data Platform. This is another example coming from our close partner, Global Fishing Watch, that we have been mentioning previously in this uh, presentation. And they are doing some pretty exciting stuff using AIS data, something else called uh, VMS data, and satellite imagery and satellite radars to illuminate illegal fishing. And uh, the blue dots uh, you see on this uh, map is uh, fishing activities that are detected by machine learning algorithms. And the re red areas are so-called transshi transshipment areas, where small boats are lying next to a big boat and offloading catch and so on. Uh, another issue that is becoming more and more important is the impact of underwater noise. And we distinguish between so sound and noise, but underwater noise uh, impacting on marine mammals and also wildlife collisions. So we can also use the data in the Ocean Data Platform and our solution to enable solutions into this field. And this is one example uh, from the Ocean Data Platform where we are looking at specific areas along the Norwegian coastline where you have different ocean industries operating, like uh, oil and gas, seismics, and also ship traffic. And then you can imagine how we can go forward to do this type of analytics and show noise, heat maps, and so on. Yet another example is uh, um, the fact that ships and sailboats and pressure crafts are traveling all over uh, the ocean and also to remote spaces where we lack data and so on. So this is one example from the latest Von the Globe race, where um, Boris Herman Racing are actually having floating, like highly automated <laughs> sensors on board their sailboats and capturing very important and relevant climate data in the upper level of the ocean across the Antarctic in more or less real time. So endless opportunities here with uh, ships, sensors, and big data to, to trend what is going on in the ocean. So none of us can do everything, but everyone can do something. And we are encouraging you from C4IR Ocean and the Ocean Data Platform to join our mission for connecting people data and technology for a healthy and productive ocean. 
So thank you for listening in. And here are a few more contact details for our organization and platform and community. So thanks a lot.